There now follows a ministerial broadcast from the Prime Minister. The coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced for decades, and this country is not alone. None of us have ever heard a message like it. This is a moment of national emergency. Will it work? Can the people of London and indeed Britain hold their collective breath? That is the test, perhaps, upon which history will judge this country. Britain shuts down. No peacetime prime minister in the modern era in this country has introduced such draconian measures. On the 23rd of March 2020, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced the country's first national lockdown. In the months since, there has been a seismic shift in all our lives. As we embark upon 2021, and hopefully the latter stages of the pandemic, now is an apt moment to reflect on how we've got to where we are. While the scientific community have taken central stage in the fight to overcome the virus, how have the social sciences helped us navigate and evaluate the UK's response? Welcome to LSEIQ. I'm James Ratti, and in this podcast, we ask social scientists and other experts to answer one intelligent question. In this episode of LSEIQ, I ask, what's the point of social sciences in a pandemic? Anthropology might not be the first academic discipline that comes to mind when thinking about what expertise is needed to confront a health crisis. And yet Laura Baer, Professor of Anthropology at LSE, has played an integral role in SAGE, the group of experts that advise the UK government. As part of the Independent Scientific Pandemic Insights Group on Behaviour in SAGE, she, along with a team based at LSE, has produced several reports that have shaped government policy. How did you get involved? Was it pre-pandemic or did they ask you uh, more close to the time? They asked me in March, actually. Uh, it was the end of March. Uh, so I wasn't there for the sort of early, perhaps most controversial beginnings of the SAGE response to the pandemic. But I'd done some work earlier um, on sort of more social approaches to infrastructures, to critical infrastructures. So they knew about my work in that context. And so I, w- I was asked in that in that setting to to come on board. And I think that uh, Chris Whitty had worked with a team of, you know, really qualified medical anthropologists around the Ebola outbreak and dealing with that, um, people like uh, Melissa Parker. And so he was aware of anthropological knowledge and its sort of relevance to these sorts of pandemic responses. So, So what was it like then? What were you expecting when you went along to your first, I presume it was a virtual meeting? It certainly wasn't what I expected. Um, It was an incredibly robust conversation about pulling policies apart and putting them back together again. Uh, It was only the sort of public health experts and the academics speaking, uh, which is sort of contrary to some of the things that you hear in the media about the role of civil servants. The civil servants just remain completely silent throughout. I mean, they listen and, and they learn, I think. And, you know, what happens is we're given questions to address by different government departments, uh, but we don't always stick to the exam question, right? (laughs) We kind of, of, you know, if it doesn't agree with our perspective on things, we kind of slightly push back, the question gets reformulated. And then it is an amazingly collective process writing the policy brief. So, you know, we put things up on Google Docs and everybody, there's always a lead or two lead writers but then everybody contributes. And so what was the first kind of body of work that you were asked to do? It was uh, a response to the threat of excess death during the first wave of the pandemic. I think that when government first came to the issue, they were thinking of it as uh, a problem of logistics and containment. And what we did was we made visible what people needed in terms of their actual social relationships in order to kind of get through this 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 crisis situation so the fact that they would really need to um, at least one person should have access to people in hospitals as uh, when they were very very unwell that that was a kind of citizen's right almost um, and also that people have had the right that there should not be, for example, um, mass cremation or a kind of default thing of cremation to prevent transmission because 
that would offend the sensibilities of, um, of Muslims, of Jewish people, and in particular would be um, sort of highly traumatic to the Jewish community because of the associ historical associations of cremation with, with um, the Second World War. So we were able to kind of enrich those logistical, practical understandings with these sort of historical, cultural and social resonances. Can you give me a couple of examples how, how an anthropological approach shed new light on the problem? So it, it, it's not true that government doesn't talk to people <laughs> when they're formulating policy, but they do it in a very sort of uh, particular kind of way, a, sort of a, a situation, sort of contained situation of, of focus groups where each person is seen as representative of, you know, a class, an age or, or a community. So what we were applying instead was an anthropological approach to that sort of engagement, which means that even the questions don't come from the, the person kind of supposedly asking the questions in those situations. It's as much about, about listening and eliciting the priorities and concerns of the people you're talking to. So people are not just representatives of a group, they are experts on their own situation. And the anthropologist's job is to kind of really amplify that already existing expertise and kind of take it into the corridors of power. I mean, obviously we take it through a whole um, sort of anthropological framework. So I would say that what the anthropologist brings is not just that technique of witnessing and listening and treating people as experts, but it's also then the sort of broader social concepts that we then insert that into, um, which would include how, for example, uh, we were talking about care, you know, how networks of informal care intersect with formal care um, to produce particular forms of disadvantage. And in the case of Good Death, uh, the Good Death Project, it was much more using those anthropological concepts of from from years ago, from the Années Sociologique, about how um, death and dying is a social passage, it's a social journey. And if that social journey is not followed, it kind of re-traumatizes the people who've lost that person. So, uh, so it, is, it is that witnessing, but it's also these concepts that have been developed sort of over 100 years in, in anthropology. Another major report that Laura and her team produced was a right to care, the social foundations of recovery from COVID-19. PhD researcher Nikita Simpson worked on the project and describes how it sought to respond to the fundamental breakdown and reshaping of social networks during the first lockdown. There was a moment where all of the kind of relationships between households that uh, we as anthropologists see as the kind of fabric of daily life were being cut off and everybody was experiencing that. So in when the lockdown was called in late March. People were moving in with each other to be able to care for children or elderly grandparents. People were struggling to uh, try and um, get mutual aid networks up and running so they could provide groceries and medicines to people who were isolated. So this was a really interesting anthropological challenge. So what we ended up with was two kinds of research data. So we had what we call spotlights, which are small kind of yeah light shining on a slice of life so there might be on being a mother or um, multi-generational Sikh families in the Midlands or um, uh, there was another one on homelessness in Cambridge so you have these kind of little pockets of knowledge um, and then we're able to scale that up into these kind of bigger uh, case studies. The report highlights multiple ways in which the idea of social networks should guide policy response. Here's Laura. You know, some of the solutions that we put in our report include more investment in, in formal care, uh, involve um, payments, sort of compensatory payments for people who've been giving informal care, and also the setting up of community recovery centres. Another recommendation was how the UK should have prioritised the formation of social bubbles, a concept that originated in New Zealand. Yet, as Laura points out, political pushback and that SAGE's guidance wasn't always heeded. I was tasked to lead on a paper on that quite early on in the response um, uh, in, uh, towards the end of April. 
that was really looking at social bubbles, not just as a way of socializing, but of maintaining these important networks of care through which we all get by and particularly disadvantaged groups get by. I'd hoped that <laughs> that, that would lead to a way, a sort of pathway out of the, the first wave that wouldn't get us into the second wave, but if those had been prioritized first. Uh, and uh, it was extremely surprising that, that that didn't actually happen. And part of the reason it didn't happen was because there was a lot of concern at that point about the R rate. So the sort of public health people pushed back against starting to have these bubble policies. And then the Dominic Cummings, you know, famous, infamous uh, Durham incident happened about three weeks or two weeks after that. Um, and the government responded by just opening everything up, right, you know, to kind of regain legitimacy. So we never had that kind of more safe pathway out, which would have enabled us first to rebuild our household foundations. Another of the report's recommendations was to move away from the narrow focus on productivity as a measure of a country's recovery and instead embrace a social calculus that accounts for the health of the economy and society. I was wondering how receptive policymakers and government are at this precise moment to, to arguments such as that. I remember a couple of years ago, I did a film about GDP and it's, you know, it goes right back to like Robert Kennedy saying GDP isn't that great. We shouldn't be using it all the time. And yet we still kind of cleave to it. So do you think we're at a moment now where kind of arguments are, are stronger and more likely to be taken on board? I think we really don't have any choice but to take these kinds of arguments on board. Um, we're not going to get through the economic effects of the pandemic using the old tools. Laura is encouraged by recent policy documents that indicate the desire to embrace new approaches. But interestingly, in the most recent Green Book guidance, there is for the first time the inclusion of the idea of you know, what sorts of social impacts is this infrastructure actually going to have? And that's like a small wedge in to a different way of looking at, at the economy. The COVID and Care Research Group's work is ongoing and is available online. While the medical response to COVID has dominated the news agenda, so too is the threats to the economy. Professor Joanne Roses has been considering the parallels we can and can't draw from other episodes in history, including the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. I asked Johan if economic history has been under-considered as a discipline during COVID and how people might misapply history to understanding contemporary problems. Sometimes I am very worried when you read in the news and the people try to associate directly what happened, I don't know, in the in the Spanish influence and what happened now and so on because the economies are quite different. Many people continuously use history and never or has not read the correct book or is based in some um, previous ideas and never asked to the historians because I suppose that we are very boring people that try to, you know, it's less spectacular than looks at the beginning. Jahan's recent paper, The Redistributive Effects of Pandemics, Evidence of the Spanish Flu, examines the impacts of the early 20th century influenza outbreak. Are there lessons that can be taken from for example, the Spanish flu, and apply to now? One big lesson is that if you don't have any means to protect the income of the people and the people had to work, the people died. Workers died, uh, owners of capital survive. Okay? If you have a system where there are no social protection, the people should go to work. You cannot avoid that. And this is the big lesson that you need to learn from this period. That's interesting because... Um, you notice a lot in debates today that there's a kind of um, argument between saving the economy, basically, and protecting health. And it seems that that kind of tension, even if it's not like a binary opposite, has a long history. Yeah, but this is not true. <laughs> oh, uh, do you know, if, if for economist point of view, and we have uh, a long history of economists worried about that, health is part of your income. Okay, it's, it's not that you can separate health from income. Okay, if you have worse health and you died, obviously this is the stream, but if you have worse health, your productivity is less. Even then, from a point of view of any government, it's stupid not to account how much costs that. So we're in a pretty bleak moment in terms of the current pandemic. 
especially from an economic perspective, people worried about their jobs, debt, long-term future. One of the things that struck me in the paper was the fact that things seem to recover economically pretty quickly for the vast majority of professions. Why did that happen? In the past, it, you imagine, it's an economy when the people produce things, okay, goods. You know, you produce, I don't know, metal goods or you go make the harvest. This means that the tertiary sector is very small and the, and the production of the tertiary sector is a very small part of the Spanish economy. Even the tertiary sector, the majority of the tertiary sector is to sell goods or to transport goods and so on. This means that immediately when you stop, you have still there the harvest. In fact, they collect the harvest and you can sell the harvest. This means that the economy is very easy to recover in this sense. Because you don't have this sophisticated economy that we have now, that we produce goods, that the people con the consumption of what is not first necessity goods is a lot of the total national income. Okay? In the Black Death, in the, in the medieval times, the people cannot go to pick up the harvest because they are dying okay, in the streets. Okay, but in this moment, the people go to pick up the harvest and you have the harvest and you export the harvest. And it reminds me of the, the panic buying that took place right at the beginning of the pandemic. And I suppose that was people being concerned, basically, that primitive idea that the crops wouldn't be harvested. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Also, it's very interesting because the people, probably the people need to watch some programs in BBC4 and show how, how we, we take the crops now, <laughs> how many few people are working taking the crops. <laughs> so where can we draw parallels from history in the light of enormous economic challenges? What you can compare what happened now in the past and what policy should be? What is the most similar thing? Okay, what is the most similar thing? And it's not the Spanish flu, in fact, it's the World War II. Anxious crowds gather in Downing Street on the opening day of the crisis debate, waiting to catch a glimpse of cabinet ministers after a preliminary meeting at the 10. In the long run, the only way out is by greater output of all the things that we need. And by a united effort, we shall win through. Because in the World War II, you have this huge, the economy has changed so much in Britain, and you begin to produce things that nobody use. Then it's useless in 1945. You finish the war, what do you do with this? Okay, what do you do with an economy that produces something that nobody needs, no longer needs? And also, what do you do with a lot of population that you have overseas fighting and come back to home and you need to give a job to these people? And it's, it's a huge crisis in, in this sense, no? because you have um, a demand and supply crisis. No? You produce something that nobody needs, like now. And, and the big lesson than. than uh, Many economic historians, we are very angry with that because then to forget what's the, what's the state, the government, what make that. And, and the big success of the 1940s, uh, late 1940s, early 1950s in UK, in Germany, in Japan. Because the people normally ask, how is Japan re got uh, so huge economic growth in the 1960s and 1950s? Or how the Germany becomes from a half-destroyed country to, a, to one of the powerful countries in the world? is because very good policy. And this is something that the people tend, uh, tend to forget. I don't know if they want to forget. So what, just this might be kind of beyond anyone's pay grade, but w if the government were to follow your advice, how should they redirect the economy? <laughs> this is the typical question to make to economists. If I know where to invest, I will be rich. I will, be <laughs> <laughs> I will not teach and so on. Ob one thing that is obvious is that there are many activities that no longer are need. Okay, you imagine, for example, what is happening in England. A huge transition to much more homework and less... Um, a less uh, people going to se central cities to shopping, okay? This transition is bad or good. It's good because the productivity now is higher. Do you imagine how many hours we lost in commuting going to, from, for example, to the LSE? How, I, I, I lost normally two hours every day going to the LSE. But this is, in every economic terms, I teach economic geography, this is a crazy amount of money. This means that you have workers that you no longer need. The government should do is, to make this transition to these people and not to abandon these people in the middle of nowhere, because this has happened in the past and uh, everybody remembers the examples, not everybody can work online. The, the problem sometimes with politicians is the preconceptions. No, they have these own ideas and they have many problems to change the 
preconceptions. One thing that is very interesting is that the, the politicians that live in the 1950s, probably because they have the crisis, the 1940s and 50s are people very flexible. Professor Johan Rose's paper on the Spanish flu is entitled The Redistributive Effects of Pandemics, Evidence of the Spanish Plea. Dr. Adam Oliver is a member of LSE's Department of Social Policy. His work concentrates on behavioural economics and behavioural public policy. I wanted to ask how behavioural economics might have shaped government policy in the early stages of the pandemic. But firstly, what exactly is behavioural economics? The definition of behavioural economics are, are observations in human decision-making behaviour that systematically conflict with the assumptions that economists, mainstream economists, rational choice theory, uh, makes about um, hum, you know, decisions and human behaviour. So the benefit of behavioural science, I think, on behavioural economics would be to try to look at to designing very specific interventions for very targeted behaviours. Just a very quick example. There's something called priming. If you remind people, and then this will sound obvious to many of your listeners, but if you remind people to do things in the moment that they're supposed to do them, that they're supposed to do those things, they're more likely to do them, right? So if you put, for example, a big picture of a germ, you know, a magnified picture of a germ above a sink, it might be that the prompt of the big germ reminds people that, you know, germs are harmful and therefore they should wash their hands. This is called priming. It's trying to get people to remember to do things in the specific moment that they're supposed to be doing those things, right? Ever since that period of about 10 years ago, just after the financial crisis in 2008, NGOs, governments, international agencies, uh, European Commission, the World Bank, etc., etc. They all became interested in how to use behavioural economics. Now, initially, um, I'd say the British government was a real sort of uh, innovator uh, in the development of behavioural economics and the use of behavioural economics in policy. And David Cameron established one of his first acts when he became Prime Minister in 2010 was to establish a behavioural insights team right in the heart of government. And they were, you know, they were quite successful in trying to get the message out of how we could perhaps use behavioural economics in some kind of policy interventions around a whole range of areas. So health promoting behaviours, how you might uh, use energy, you know, gas and electricity more efficiently, how you might get ta greater tax compliance. So how might that have fed into the messaging in March? namely the um, stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. It's very difficult for people generally to respond to complexity. If the message is too confused and too complex, it has to be very, very simple. And if you can imbue within the message some kind of collective concern, then people might respond to that. I mean, I wrote a book on reciprocity that was published last year, the notion that people are likely to return um, kindness with kindness or punish people that step out of line. That's negative reciprocity. This is very fundamental to human nature. It's a form of enlightened self-interest. And it goes against what many believe to be the core assumption in standard economics, which is one of egoism. So save the NHS. What do British people value perhaps more than anything else is the NHS, isn't it? Right. So getting the NHS in there. And then, of course, saving lives, something that's very stark and very profound. Clear message about what you want to do. It's in the collective interests for us to do this. And there's profound negative externalities potentially if you don't do it, i.e. people, more people are going to die if you don't do this. Irrational behaviour is something I'm especially interested in. And I'm thinking here about the panic buying that happened at the very beginning of the pandemic. Tensions flared at Woolworth Chalora around 7 o'clock this morning when three women became involved in a toilet paper tussle. I just want one pack. No, not one pack. Can your expertise help shed light on why this happened? The hoarding was a strange one, wasn't it? Because it spread from overseas as well. I mean, I know that the Australians, for instance, they were hoarding toilet rolls before the British started to hoard toilet rolls. So it's almost kind of like this cascade, what we, behavioural scientists call these cascade effects. You know, you see things that other people are doing and you don't logically really think about whether you ought to be doing this yourself, whether it's re really rational to do this, but because other people are doing it, you know, we must do it too. Now, a lot of people think that, you know, these kind of cascade effects is a sign of human stupidity, but it, it's not really, I mean, it's, it's an evolutionary response. You know, how we learn is through copying other people, essentially. That's how, you know, we evolve. That's how human beings have evolved in their societies um, to 
you know, transfer culture from one generation to the next. So it, it has its purpose. I mean, just if I can just sort of have a slight, it's a related digression. I think that there's three core motivations of human behaviors. And I think the three ultimately are egoism, selfish egoism, which I said a moment ago is the thing that uh, informs, or most people think informs standard economic theory or rational choice theory. And that, I think, probably was feeding into the hoarding behaviours. The other one is reciprocity, or this fundamental motivator of human behaviour that explains why societies flourish in many ways. And this is called enlightened self-interest. So you care about other people in the notion that hopefully they will then care about you. I'll give you an example from Vampire Bats. This is from Vampire Bats, right? Vampire bats, they'll go out each evening and they'll try, to cut, they'll try to get some blood from somewhere, but only on about one third or one quarter of the nights is each individual bat successful. What scientists have shown is that successful bats, when they go back to the cave, they will share some of that blood with unsuccessful bats on that night. When the bats go out again, the bats that were previously unsuccessful but that are now successful on that night, they'll go back to the cave and they'll find the bat, the unrelated bat, and reciprocate, right? That's good for both of them. That's good for the society of bats. And the other, the other one is pure altruism. So you just give to other people unconditionally all the time. I think that's relatively rare, personally. <laughs> right. I think recipro- reciprocity and uh, egoism are the two fundamental ones. And too much egoism can destroy the group. It can destroy the group. So if some kind of messaging had been put in place, their, uh, their enlightened reciprocal motivations... You know, if you take too much pasta on this shelf, then granny down the street won't have any pasta for herself. You know, don't be too selfish. Those sorts of things. Then that may have ameliorated, the, you know, this run on pasta and, uh, and toilet rolls that some people, some pe- not everybody, of course, but some people committed. One of the most contentious decisions in 2020 was whether the country went too late into lockdown. At the time, the chief medical officer suggested a reason not to go into lockdown immediately was that people might suffer from behavioural fatigue. It is important on this. Uh, It's not just a matter of what you do, it is also a matter of when you do it. Because anything we do, we've got to be able to sustain. Once we've started these things, we will have to continue them through the peak, and that is for a period of time. And there is a risk if we go too early, people will understandably get fatigued, uh, and it'll be difficult to sustain this over time. So when they were talking about the pandemic, and so it became under this term behavioural, this catch-all term behavioural fatigue. And the behavioural scientists responded to that, I think, because they'd never, they'd never, um, they don't recognise a term, a formal term, behavioural fatigue. Right? So there was a an open letter where six or seven hundred behavioural scientists um, complained about the government being slow in locking down the UK uh, society due to this concept of behavioural fatigue. They say, we just don't recognise this concept of behaviour. It's not a scientific term. There's no evidence for it, etc. It's not a thing they were saying. But to me personally, as a catch-all term, uh, in considering what to do in these very, very unusual and highly uncertain circumstances at the time when they were considering lockdown, whether to lockdown or not, it seems to me as though it's legitimate to at least consider what might happen if people do tire of being locked down. Dr. Adam Oliver's book, Reciprocity and the Art of Behavioural Public Policy, is out now. Global health policy is an area that's able to robustly evaluate how well countries have responded to COVID. Dr Claire Wenham is Associate Professor of Global Health Policy at LSE. My research is on global health security, which is looking at outbreak response, pandemic preparedness, and in particular within that, I look at the kind of politics and policy decisions that go into this. What would you expect a kind of national government to have prepared for when facing a potential pandemic? Many ways of analysing how prepared a country is to respond to the outbreak um, have been done. And for example, there was this thing called the Global Health Security Index, which came out just last autumn which uh, rated countries by a whole range of indicators about how ready they were to have a pandemic outbreak. And the US scored first and the UK scored second. And so I think that shows us that we should, on paper at least, be the the most uh, able to respond. However, I think the thing that these indices lack and the thing uh, that, that 
people don't necessarily talk about enough is the, the, the politics. We were in a much better position than countries like Vietnam, like Thailand, to be able to respond to this on paper. So why have they been able to get this under control more so than we have? And that is purely political decision making and political prioritization at a time of crisis. So we're still at the very early stages of kind of evaluating how things went. But if you were to earmark particular political decisions, both at the beginning of the pandemic and prior to it, that may have impeded our response, what would those be? So I think a key thing is um, we just didn't stop people coming into our country, right? We know that the, the in early March, for example, that several countries had implemented travel bans, right? Or several in or, or were requiring anyone coming into the country, particularly from high risk areas to go into quarantine. Now we did that for Chinese uh, people coming from Wuhan and people coming on Chinese flights. We put them into quarantine. I'm sure you all remember those, those buses going to Arrow Park. And we weren't quarantining people from, from Spain and Italy, for example, to other places which had very high rates of coronavirus at this time. And there was a decision at some point in March to move from contain to delay. So contain is when you're trying to pick up those exact cases, right, and trying to find them, contact trace around them and make sure those cases aren't spreading. Delay is when you're just trying to stop it, stop the peak coming, you know, a, a, a sharp a sharp spike in your peak and making it, it long and rumbling. Now, that decision, I think, was fundamentally wrong, right? I think fundamentally we should have been trying to catch all the cases because, you know, letting other cases come in and say, oh, well, there's community transmission here anyway is sort of admitting defeat. Now, I don't know why that decision was made. Um, there's a lot of talk about herd immunity as a priority. But I think there's also something about British exceptionalism in here, right? That this will never happen to us because outbreaks are something that happen elsewhere in the world. We have the deputy chief medical officer in the UK in March saying we don't need to follow World Health Organization guidance because that's designed for the world. When an outbreak has happened previously, like Ebola, like, um, like Zika, we've seen you know, the countries, uh, countries globally would help, right? In Ebola, it took a bit of time. There's been criticism for how long it took. But you saw Western governments, for example, supporting West African countries to get out of the outbreak. And we, you, know, you saw the same in Brazil during Zika. You see the same in Yemen with cholera. You know, we do see that kind of international solidarity. The problem is this outbreak is everywhere. Claire is also cognizant of the knock-on health consequences the pandemic is having. So we're now seeing, for example, you know, long cancer treatment waiting lists, which are going to have a much more substantial effect on people's health uh, and probably for a lot more people in the longer term. We know that um, you know, maternal mortality might well increase as a result of not having routine antenatal treatment or not having routine antenatal appointments with scans at regular intervals. And then I think there's, there's a much bigger and scarier risk, which is the long-term implications of, of poverty on people's health. So, you know, we know that people who live in poverty, people who are at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, experience worse, worse health outcomes for a whole range of reasons. And that's well documented in the literature. And then the final part of that is thinking about mental health. So we know that the pandemic and the associated lockdown with that has had a huge effect on people's mental health. Some quite interesting research in New Zealand has shown that actually people's anxiety and mental health around the outbreak is much worse for younger people than it is for older people. I was speaking to a behavioural scientist the other day and he said one of the things that the government did well was the kind of the collectivism in the kind of campaigning that everyone's in it together. But I wonder if that has had some negative consequences in that certain vulnerable groups weren't thought about enough. I think I disagree. I would say the government didn't put a message out that we're all in this together. I think that there are certain people who are in this together that the government includes and large swathes of the population who don't fit into that. Um, a lot of my research looks at the impact on women. And I think for our, from our research, we've shown that women aren't part of this and the government hasn't thought about women at all in responding to this outbreak. So you know, that's at least 50% of our, of our population who are outside. The fact that no one really thought about domestic violence till May, that was the first time we saw the Home Office come out with, with increased funding for domestic violence, when we know that 90% of domestic violence happens in the home. So what happens when you shut everyone in home for, for two months? Well, of course you're going to see rates of domestic violence go up. When schools shut and suddenly all the kids are at home, social norms dictate that it's going to be the women who 
pick up most of that care. Our research is systematically showing that women are absorbing this additional care. Some really interesting research that came out from the ONS has shown people's time use during lockdown. And it's shown that, yes, while men have been doing more domestic activities and childcare during the outbreak, women have been doing significantly more. And the ONS data broke down the difference between developmental and non-developmental childcare that was happening. And so developmental childcare is kind of homeschooling, playing games, getting kids to, to learn and develop. And non-developmental childcare is, you know, keeping them alive, right? Feeding them, washing them, getting them dressed. And you know, women are doing all the non-developmental childcare. And where men are doing some, it's in the, it's in the fun stuff. Claire continues to write extensively about COVID. Professor Patrick Wallace of the Department of Economic History researches the economic, social, and medical history of Britain and Europe from the 16th to the 18th century. In 2005, he wrote a paper about the town of Eme, near Nottingham, which in 1666 was struck down with the plague. Since COVID, renewed interest in Eme prompted Patrick to write a follow-up piece for The Economist's 1843 magazine, highlighting the story and the lessons we should learn from it. What first drew you to this topic? I was looking for epi local epidemics that I could really get into the history of. Um, I was part of a big project thinking about how societies respond to threats. So, so Eames myth is, is it's a really powerful and famous one. The idea of a village where plague arrives in a bundle of clothes from London. The village gets infected and, and rapidly the plague spreads. And then something incredible happens. They decide to isolate themselves to save the rest of the county, the rest of the region from plague spreading out of the village. They decide to stay in the parish, they do so. As a result, plague doesn't spread, but enormous numbers of the parishioners die. I mean, in, in the early accounts, it's sometimes 60, 70%. Um, and this whole effort is led by the local vicar. So you've got a heroic leader um, who helps bring the villagers together. Um, and at the end of the plague, or towards the end of the plague, his, actual, his wife dies. So there's, there's enormous tragedy there. Eames' plague has spawned multiple retellings over the years including the 1973 film, Roses of Eam. Our lives are at stake. If we stay here, we'll die. Oh, if you go, you'll die in the next valley instead of this one. And there, others will die with you. How many murderers have we here? How many men who will stick a knife into a friend's back? Or beat a child's head to fragments with a spade? Or poison a woman for money? There is no difference! It's not hard to see that Eam's tale of self-imposed isolation, and indeed sacrifice, is all the more powerful at the moment. But how true is the story? Well, I mean, the odd thing about this was that the more I looked, the less it became obvious that we actually knew about this. Um, it was like unpicking a scab. You know, you, you took a layer off and then you looked for the sources and you realized there weren't any. You went down another layer and so on. And actually, we know really very little about some of the crucial elements of this. We know there was a plague, right? We've got a burial register. We know enormous numbers of people died. This was horrible. Um, but what we don't really know about is the leadership, and we don't know about the decision. So we don't know if they isolated themselves. And in fact, there's good reason to believe that they were isolated, right? We have these records of uh, Sheffield paying for constables, right? Yeah, you don't put police around the edge of somewhere that's isolating itself. Eam offers this wonderful example of a community <laughs> that stay together. It's a fantastically ordered world. And so we find ourselves in the midst of a pandemic now. Have you kind of picked up on how EAM has been used, if at all, in kind of this current moment? Yeah, so one of the reasons I went back to this um, in the summer is that I'd been surprised to find, um, not, I suppose unsurprised to find that various newspapers were starting to write about this. And it seemed to me that they were retelling an old story, a story that... Um, gave us some kind of historical framework within, within which to understand the kinds of sacrifice that we are being asked to offer. Um, and I think that's, that to me is why it's important to think critically about histories of past plagues, because our response to epidemics are, you know, is necessarily based on past practice, it's based on history. And the thing that seemed to me to be telling here is that the kind of, the kind of morality, the moral story, the values that Eam had been written to convey were being put forward as a message to the world. Now, I don't disagree with the values that were being advocated here. It seems to me that this is a time for 
heroism, a time for self-sacrifice, a time for service. But it's here we had a story where those values had been written onto the evidence, then being used to advocate for those values, um, which is not great in terms of actually providing empirical evidence for their importance. And so while I think Eam is, a, is an amazing story and its reconstruction is itself a fascinating thing, to me it's not a great guide to help us um, think through our own moral problems. Arguments built on myths are built on sand. And that kind of story about uh, an imagined exceptionalism to Brit the British character that somehow uh, provides us with a free pass from various requirements or obligations or pressures or tensions that seems to me to be a nice story to tell about a nation, but not a great basis on which to make policy. Is it too far to say that that somehow England kind of has, has um, developed a sense of itself partly on this kind of myth of what happened at Eam? Well, you know, I think that's, there's, there's definitely something in that. Um, one of the reasons why this story becomes famous in the first place is that it offers a hero in the form of, of Montpassant who can be put out there to show that a certain kind of modest heroism of quiet, staunch self-sacrifice is, is an aspect of the British character that has run through the ages. I feel that there's an argument for trying to romanticise things at the moment, like the, the, the clapping for carers, the, the sense that we're all getting in, going through something together. And that kind of relies on I suppose, certain narratives about who we are and the sacrifices we're prepared to make. Can you still have that while having a more empirical approach? Or is narrative kind of always a little bit dangerous? <laughs> um, ooh. I mean, this, this to me is kind of science versus myth, isn't it, as, as, as ways of leading a, a nation. And I, do, I think um, hopefully that, that will never be a choice. Uh, but I think... Um, what we need to keep in mind is that myth is, myth is a, a wonderful source of morale and a great way to bring people together and shape identity. Uh, but myths often obscure hard choices and homogenize um, preferences and the decisions that are made. The main message, message I take from thinking about Eam is the need to be careful about what evidence we draw on when we think about the planning for and our response to an epidemic. One of the reasons I became interested in EAM is that I've been writing about how doctors should react to epidemics. What moral obligations did medical personnel have when faced by a threat to themselves? And there was a fascinating debate in the 1980s in response to HIV AIDS where a debate about the ethics of doctors during 1665, the Great Plague of London was being used as evidence for why physicians had a moral obligation to accept any risk that they were concerned about in treating uh, people with HIV AIDS. Um, and so I, to me, I, I went back and it, it turned out there was no expectation in 1665 that, that doctors would treat people with plague because they had no effective tools to do that. But the, 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 the thing that, that concerned me there is that we can heroism is, is 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 a wonderful thing to be celebrated but it's a real risk if we start to expect heroism of a particular group um, rather than respecting heroism when it occurs tell us what you think using the hashtag lseiq This episode of LSEIQ was produced by James Ritty. This episode was based in part on the following research. COVID and care research groups a good death during the COVID-19 pandemic in the UK, a report on key findings and recommendations, and a right to care, the social foundations of recovery from COVID-19, the redistributive effects of pandemics, evidence of the Spanish flu, by Sergi Basco, Georgie Domenech, and Johan Rosses separating behavioural science from the herd, and reciprocity and the art of behavioural public policy, both by Adam Oliver. What is the future of UK leadership in global health security post-COVID-19? By Claire Wenham.
A Dreadful Heritage, Interpreting Epidemic Disease at EM 1666 to 2000, and EM Revisited, Lessons from Plague Village, both by Patrick Wallace. For more episodes of this podcast and to subscribe, please visit lse.ac.uk forward slash IQ or search for LSE IQ in your favourite podcast app. And please consider leaving us a review as this makes the podcast easier for new listeners to discover.